professional learning sessions! What I want to model for you right now, it's the, the common experience a lot of students get. Um, it's a relationship between a plant, an algae, and a fungus. The fungi provides the structure for the organism, and then the algae provides the food for, through photosynthesis. So some people describe it as Freddy fungus and Alice algae took a liking to each other. And they have this relationship, a symbiotic relationship, and they're able to survive through their symbiotic relationship together. What do students get out of an experience like that? It's a vocabulary. It's a vocabulary? Mm -hmm. Provided them with information, um, but in I would say unless you added some kind of tangible looking, exploring it, they may not, they may not use it. They might not use that information to, as you walk down the trail. All of those definitions they could have gotten from a textbook, you made it more fun and more accessible for them maybe, um, but not really that hands-on experience. So you're starting to actually drift into the next question, which is what's, no, it's great, <laughs> is um, what do students not get? What might be missing for students in an experience like that with Lichen? Like relationship with that life. Like an intimate exchange. You can't get close enough to see it when it's just held up to a large group. One of the things we want to think about throughout this session is a little bit about how to get kids into deeper learning experiences than what you might have just encountered with the like and talk, right? Um, and, but we want to really give you a, a, a more solid sense of what does that mean? What does it mean to go deeper, right? So the first thing we want to have you do is think about a time when you really learned something very well. Something that you learned that you ho still hold on to, that you still remember, that you think is valuable for you. And think about how did you learn it? And if there was any kind of like little sequential process that happened, might jot down some notes about that too. So I want you to do a quick write right now in your journal. Now I'd like you to turn to a partner and describe that experience, but really describe what about it um, made it enduring for you and what, what particular, in particular, um, worked for you in, in terms of how you learned it. Learning how to watercolor, that I needed, I needed to practice a lot to make a lot of mistakes to know what my questions were. Now what we're going to try and do is share out some commonalities. So like, what was it about these experiences? Can we find any commonalities? Are there some things that might be similar? My world geography teacher in seventh grade used a lot of different imagery and his own personal story to, to portray those facts. So, One-on-one -on -one hands-on experience with the instructor. An expert, someone who knew a little more than you, working one-on-one -on -one and coaching you. Hands-on, uh, in, in our cases, were that was paramount, to be able to manipulate something and also have some frustration uh, with, with it, have some failures that we learned how to, you know, succeed by, by our failures. And we had kind of the cycle of trying, failing, having critique, constructive critique, going back through that cycle over and over again. But then there was an end game both of us talked about where we took that skill and did something different with it. Something about a switch in context helped right. you to get deeper with that skill? We have on strips stages of a lichen exploration activity. And what we'd like you to do in pairs is to try to come up with what you think would be a great sequence, the best sequence you can come up with, um, thinking about meaning making, for, about learning for, for students. What would be the best sequence? And it's not about just going, okay, here, 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 here. It's about discussing with your partner each decision you're making. What's your reasoning behind wanting to have this first and this thing second? I don't think that goes now. I kind of like, wonder if I go up here. If this is going to be one of the last things that they aren't going to know that lichen terminology until after like done some questioning. To go together, right? So maybe that's when this comes in. Is it a plant or a fungus? Well, actually, it's both, and we call it a lichen. Did you share out? 
your reasons for why you were putting them in particular order with each other? So you've, you've had a little pre-think about how to do this and why? Okay, so we're going to add a little bit of input for you now. Where we're going to have you read about one of the phases of the learning cycle. And we have a handout that has the learning cycle stages listed on it. What I'm going to have you do is read over just the part that is about the phase that's listed on the little card that you're getting on your table and think about what the goals are for that learning cycle phase and really talk about that first with the whole table, table group. And then your job is to pick one of those strips and try and figure out, could be one or more of those strips that would particularly serve the goal for that learning phase. Go for it. Andy and I were saying that under the paragraph exploration on your sheet, it says I was keen in on learners engage in open-ended exploration of stuff in the natural world. And there's the one that said, students are challenged to spend 10 minutes looking for different examples of this word creature. Correct. To me, that was like, explore. It's hard to see. There's not a real boundary between, oh, here I'm moving into this. Yeah. It, it, can, it can be fluid. It can move back right. and forth. I'm really curious to see if Freddy Fungus ends up being like a hook. Invitation. Instead of, the, I mean, it seems like Part of it's meat. You could eat you could yeah. be either. Right. It was confusing. Using just now to hear as an invitation because it was hard. Like we all just said it was hard. There was a lot in there and it didn't right. have a context yet to make sense. Right. right. Which is why I don't think it would end up as part of an invitation. I think it has. It's too, it's too dense. You don't. You haven't explored it at all yet. You don't know. You're not building off of anything. It's I think just all in a many, set of info. many times it has been used as that. We're gonna go outside actually and make a big learning cycle, but before we go out there. Um, I'm just going to give you just a couple seconds to check in with your group because we're going to have bigger versions of everything. We're going to have a big learning cycle laid out on the ground out there and also big sentence strips for each of the parts of the lichen activity that you just worked with. And I'm going to go through each of the phases, talked about one by one, and I'm going to ask you guys to introduce a little bit about that phase and the particular goals and then why you chose a particular part of the activity to connect with that particular phase of the learning cycle, okay? So somebody's got to be a spokesperson, that's why I'm asking you to check in with each other a little bit. So I'd like the people that um, were assigned invitation to start and just kind of give the basic, they're already on the sign, but just the basic goals of that particular um, phase and then a little bit about why you and grab one of the strips that you thought should go there and place it there and then tell us why you did it. The one we had dissension <laughs> about was students look for different examples of this weird organism. Okay. So that was the one we were kind of still discussing. Okay. But we did feel like the students discussing with a partner, is this living organism a plant or fungus? How could we tell if it's a plant or a fungus? Because we felt like yeah. it allowed them to draw on their previous knowledge yes. and encourage them to make observations. What we sort of differed with is whether or not we felt like the weird organism needed to be, I guess I'm using the word primed with writing the word lichen on the board. Ah. So some of us felt like that came later and some other people felt like it was sort of the lead in. It's a lovely example of an instructional decision that we got to make every day when we're teaching kids. Excellent. Anybody else want to say anything about invitation before we go on? Okay. So invitation essentially an opportunity for students to think about prior knowledge, to be able to know what they know about whatever the topic is that you're discussing. Chance for you to hear a little bit about that too often if you, if you allow them to talk about it. Um, and to really set the stage for whatever the topical exploration of an idea is going to be. Talking about the student experience, they should feel invited in somehow. The hook, oftentimes. Mm -hmm. A hook is another hook. way that people talk the about hook has to include the prior knowledge, prior experience of the student, which when people talk about the hook, they talk about some entertaining thing or some great right. you know, thing, oh, this is why it's cool. But we want that hook to be connected directly to the learner. And so we call it the invitation. And as you participate in this activity, we'd like to ask you to participate, you know, go for it, do the activity, and hopefully you'll enjoy that. And if, but at the same time, Somebody said metacognitive a little earlier. Get metacog here, baby. Um, be thinking about the activity in another way. Think about it from like above, like what's going on here in terms of the learning cycle. And to help you do that, we have assistants who will be holding up little signs for us here. I'll hold up a sign. That's just our idea of potentially what phase is going on at that moment. 
Well, it's interesting if you analyze activities with learning cycle, there's different ways there's of different interpreting ways. it. Not every activity has like some clean learning cycle where you go do, 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 do. Oftentimes it's like this do, 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 do. And you might notice that today yeah, in this activity. Cool. What is it? This is an organism. It's, it's a living thing. But what do you think, it, what kind of organism do you think it might be? So in order to be an organism, it has to be able to have stuff to, you know, like nutrients, and it has to be able to have matter to consume, and it has to have energy to do things. How do you think that this sucker might survive? Tell the person next to you what ideas you might have. Yeah, I was actually thinking something like along the same lines, like it collects nutrients from the air. Yeah. 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 So what I want you to do now, in just a minute, is to go around this area, and I want you to see if you can find stuff that's like this. Let's see how many different kinds of this stuff we can find. And let's see what kinds of surfaces we might find it growing on. And let's try and think about more, how does this stuff survive? And what is it? What kind of, how would you classify this? You're welcome to bring some back if you want to. Um, but you're not welcome to pull it off of, if it's living like on something, please don't yank it off, but it's on the ground, then go ahead and bring it back, okay? My mind's very green, I think it's a plant. I think mine's plant too. I got some white going down, but... Oh, yours is kind of... Oh, they're both kind of dark on the other side. Yeah, they are. That one's got like a different one. See that oh, one wow, look at that. Ooh. You can tell... Gnarly. Maybe, yeah, gnarly. It's got like a brown one. Maybe that one's dead. Exactly. The, the, down here definitely looks not as fresh as this guy right here. Mm -hmm. Nothing looks as happy as this, this one, though. Good. What makes you think Venus flytrap just the shape of it? The shape? And the hair is on the outside. Kind of clothes yeah. in, like a mouth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the coolest cool. one. Is this the same kind he had? It looks similar. Yeah. Well, like, we're, that's, I think that's the winner there. The one that Reed has, though, is a really nice yeah. shade of green. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Good. It looks this like very antlers. Leafy. Yeah, yeah. It looks like antlers. salad. Uh -huh. Yeah, like salad. That's why I think it's a plant. What did you find? We were looking at how some of this stuff's really green. And some of it is not green. Where is it? They're not green. Like here. Really not green. Some of it was like beard. So it was more antler. Some of it was crusty. Like there's crusty patches on the beard. Uh, on the, yeah. Like, antler. Yeah. Crusty. crusty. Do you guys know what he's talking about? Yeah. Yep. Antler. What about antler? Well, the antler. The is structure kind of like, like, kind of like, like this. The, the crystalline oh. kind of yeah, yeah. structure. Lettuce like too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Lettuce like. Yeah. What are some other shapes that you? Have? Describe Venus flytrap. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's some on that one too. Or dragonfly. Yeah. With the cups oh, on the end. Yeah, yeah. Octopus yeah. suction. Yeah. 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 Octopus oh, suction yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. Can you point out what you mean by octopus suction? Oh, yeah. Suction it was the end of the antler one had some little ox, uh, octopus suction cups. Oh, so it's not that, those Venus flytrappy things. It's, no. it's no. those ones. When you pull on it, you can see a white filament in the inside. So you can pull on it inside, you're seeing white? Yep. And it's a little bit stretchy. This one had lots of little hairs on it. Black oh, hairs. Black hairs on it? Evidence on, is this a fungus or a plant or what could it be? Got fungus doesn't photosynthesize, right? Fungus does not photosynthesize. We, d we dealt with that before during our fungus yeah. activity. Yeah. Fungi do not photosynthesize. And Evidence would suggest that it's photosynthesizing, it being a green plant. Because it's green? Now, do all green things photosynthesize? Not green cars. <laughs> green cars, is that you said? <laughs> do all green organisms photosynthesize? Frogs don't. Frogs don't. Yeah, they <laughs> don't. Some plants are not green, but still photosynthesize. We were looking at that, you know, that stretchiness, mm -hmm. and when you stretch away the outer part, the, the stretchy part inside is white but the outer part was green. So we were wondering, is photosynthesis happening outside, not inside? I want to tell you a little story, just a brief little story here. And that's about Freddy fungus and Andy algae. We've been dealing with an adaptation theme during today. Remember that was our theme? Oh yeah. Remember we talked about how adaptations are behaviors or structures that help an organism to survive? In this case, Maybe it's a little boat. It's, it's a relationship. Relationship between the algae and the fungi that help allow it to survive. And without each other, they don't survive. We have a lichen key for you. So this is a pretty easy key to use. It's, it's a 
pictorial key. It means you look at the picture and you try and find stuff that looks like that picture. But here's a problem that some people have. This one here, this first one, it says leafy. Leafy means it looks kind of like leaves. But if you look at that, that actually doesn't look exactly like any leaf that I'm familiar with. But it looks kind of leafy. It's not exactly like that. Anything that looks kind of leafy and is lichen belongs in that category, but it won't look exactly like that. Okay. The second one here is crusty. And crusty is kind of like a scab. You know when you, get, you cut yourself and you get a scab and it's kind of attached everywhere on you and you can pick it off, but you shouldn't. <laughs> Same thing with the crusty lichen. Don't pick it off, but it's attached everywhere onto something, kind of like a scab is. So that's crusty lichen. And if you look here, the crusty lichen there is yellow or orangish, but it can be different colors. It can look lots of different ways too, but it's not going to look leafy. And then the third one here we is we're calling it shrubby lichen. You know what a shrub is? It's like a bush. You might find something where you go, wow, that looks a little leafy and shrubby or crusty and leafy. You might find some things that don't quite fit neatly in here. That happens all the time in science. You try to put things in these little boxes and then you find things that don't categorize super easily. So what you're going to do next is you're going to use these keys and fan out around the area where you just were and see how you can do with identifying. So crusty White. and leafy and shrubby. Oh, and, oh. <laughs> and then what would you call those ones up there? These ones? Yeah. I don't know. I guess I'm leaning towards leafy, just because it looks like each of the strands is a rolled up flat piece. Sure, like maybe this is sort of halfway in between. Where these are just more like round tube stocky bits. These are like flat pieces that have. I think you're right, that based on how this attaches, attaches it has to be leafy, right? What'd you discover? On one tree, I think we saw Five different types? There was one that wasn't green, that it had some orangish reddish spots. Orange? So it was spots on what color? Gray? Whitish? Gray with orangish reddish spots. Oh. Reed and I were having a hard time finding the, uh, the lichen, the crusty. the crusty. And then Reed had a great idea and we started looking at the rocks. And then boom, two different colors side by side. Yeah. Got a little hand lenses out and. It was on. Yep. <laughs> it was on the rock. Yeah. <laughs> we just got oh, some tiny bits of uh, crusty, sort of interspersed with the uh, shrubby and leafy. Tiny bits of crusty interspersed with shrubby and leafy on the on the tree. On the branches. Yeah. Anybody else just see any crusty stuff on branches? Raise your hand if you did see that. And on the main trunk. <laughs> on the trunk. And on the trunks. Yeah. Right now, it's small. Huh. Raise your hand if you saw a crusty on the rock. Raise your hand if you saw Leafy on the rock. Huh. So in the rest of our hike, those might be some more questions we might investigate. Can, you, can shrubby grow on rocks and can Leafy grow on rocks and what else grows on those rocks? Let's focus on rocks more on our hike because we didn't do too much of that here. It was mostly tree-ish right here, right? Okay. So back to the first question now. What the heck is this? What is lichen? What kind of organism is it? How does it survive? Do you have any evidence that you can throw in to add to this little party here? Crusty lichen tends to grow on rocks and kind of colonize it. And then leafy lichen often lands on top of crusty lichen and grows on top of crusty lichen and kills the crusty lichen it's on top of. And then sometimes shrubby lichen grows on top of the leafy lichen. It's like they, they, each one of them changes the environment slightly enough so that the other one can survive there. Crusty to leafy to shrubby. And then sometimes moss grows on top too. And then sometimes just these old regular plants over here start to grow on top of that. So in just a second, let's take a look around and see if we can see any of that ordering going on. Uh, okay, okay. Oh, 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 there we go. So we got um crusty and some crusty leafy. and some leafy. There we go. Mm -hmm. Not much of a shrub though. 
I think it's be pretty hard to pull off that get, one. Get, get, the, get the, the triple threat. Yeah. <laughs> so here again. Oh, here's the other one. Oh, here's, here we go. Here's the leafy. Oh, th there's a crusty. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's gather up again, please. Raise your hand if you saw any of that succession going on. Oh, interesting. I have two questions for you to do. The first one is, what are you still curious about? What do you wonder about lichen? You got that question? Here's your second question. Pretend you have a younger brother or sister, and maybe you do actually. <laughs> um, describe to the, your partner as if they're your younger brother or sister what you've learned about lichen today. And not just things that I might have said, but what you learned just through your observations and through talking to each other. I wonder how far up a tree you can find crusts and whether the difference, we have that. The, the three categories that we identified, whether or not they grow just on certain levels of the forest or whether you can find them throughout you know, a forest structure. Sure. In this particular case, doing this like an activity, what do you think it was about the flow um, that enables students and yourselves to learn a little bit about the lichen? Um, let's do a turn and talk and then let's share out a little bit. I really like the exploration of like getting out and looking at things and having that time to, to run around. And not really he did that really well. I like that experience. I liked that it allowed them to construct their own knowledge before the teacher gave them any knowledge or concepts. Um, and I like that there was skills hidden within that too, like classifying uh, and uh, hypothesizing and without even using those words. So you had time to think about things, you had time to touch things, you had time to wander around, you had time to discuss with somebody. Everything that you were doing you had to stop doing it before you wanted to stop doing it. <laughs> so then you... Is that you, a bad thing? No, you it's, on it's, this, it's it? a good thing. Oh, no, I thought it was a good thing because you weren't done. You are like, I want to know more. And then Emily told us a little bit more and then she let us go back again. You started with the exploration, well, after you were invited. Uh, you, you, you were able to explore sort of openly and kind of just find a bunch of stuff and get used to the area and then you came back and you learned a little and then when you went back you were still exploring but it was just with a little bit more structure. So some kind of building is happening is what I think you're pointing out, yeah? Yes. And that building is, is intentional. But this opportunity for struggling with ideas, we're going to unpack that just a little bit more. Um, how do we provide opportunities for students to be a little bit challenged? And I don't mean struggle in a bad way. And we can also rephrase it as a challenge or as a mental, you know, a challenge that's happening in order to sort of stretch your thinking. Learning is about figuring things out. It's not about memorizing content. And this is what we need to convey to our teachers who are asking for tons of content. There were so many opportunities when we just did like and for meaning making to happen. And it didn't just happen in one phase. It happened a lot through the questions that were asked of, of the learners. It was, why do you think that? It was, what makes you think, you know, how could you explain what you're seeing? What is the connection between this structure and what you're noticing about the way this thing is growing? Um, those kinds of questions are all opportunities for meaning making. And it often doesn't happen um, when you're just asking for what kids noticed, there's, there's this round robin thing that I've seen happen a lot where everybody shares one thing they noticed and there's no making sense of it. It just ends up being everybody shares these disparate things that don't necessarily get connected. So it takes a bit of artistry to either make connections, help students make connections between their various noticings or to ask the right question that will engender that, those connections to happen just sort of by themselves. We've worked with a, a few groups of naturalists to try and help them apply the learning cycle. And we've also worked with teachers to help them apply learning cycle to designing instruction. And there's some things that come up. And one of the things that comes up is that concept introduction thing of throwing in those concepts and those vocabulary things really too soon. And not allowing for um, students to have some sort of experience before they have a word to tag onto it. It's kind of my rule of thumb, if it's a big word, especially like a conceptual word, I want them to have some sort of experience where they need the word in order to explain what they have experienced. The other thing is really not having time to apply 
um, and that often gets left out. That and the reflections phase are the two most often left off phases of the learning cycle. And then the other thing that we notice a lot is that people stay in one phase that they kind of feel comfortable with. Some folks just dig the exploration and that's all they do with kids. But really often yeah. people get Sorry. stuck in the concept invention phase. There are field instructors who do that too, in a fun way, but it's still delivering content. <laughs> And then suddenly somebody goes, look, a banana slug. And there's a banana slug right dead center of the circle. I'm like, what do you notice? So they just started saying all kinds of things that they're noticing about the banana slug. And they're just totally riveted on this banana slug. Can we answer any of the questions you're coming up with through our observations? And we started to do that. After that, I let this ride for a little bit. Um, then I said, now I've read in a book about banana slugs that there are, let's see those four tentacles at the front? Um, that two of them are for seeing and two of them are more for feeling. So let's check it out. Let's see if we can find evidence to, to support that or not. And so the kids started to come up with little mini investigations of what to do gently <laughs> with the banana slug to figure it out. So invitation, the banana slug kind of invited itself. <laughs> when you have an exciting organism, there's not a lot of invitation you need to do. And what I'd also suggest when you have an exciting organism, to don't be saying, well, what do you know about this organism? What are your prior experience? I wouldn't do that right then, because I think it's best to just go to, what do you notice? And just be right there with that organism. So we did the, um, the uh, so that was our invitation. Our exploration was just checking it out, make, spewing questions and observations. Um, I introduced a little bit of content, but the kids invented content without me saying stuff too. It's not just me introducing it. They invented some concepts. But um, so the one that I did introduce, then we applied it by trying to come up with little investigations with the banana slug. And then as we were walking down the trail afterwards, I did some reflection questions while they were walking away with partners. So that's a mini learning cycle. And I think it's really useful for field instructors because the first impulse when you come across an organism is, oh, check it out, it's a banana slug and or here's the song about the banana slug, or who wants to join the banana slug kissing club, or there's all these things. Um, but knowing about the learning cycle makes you go, wait a minute, where's the exploration? Got to do some exploration here. And after the exploration, oh, concept invention. Oh, they're starting to invent concepts. And you know, I could tell them everything I know about banana slugs, but um, maybe I'll just tell them this. And then, oh, application. Oh, we got to do something with this. The kids have to apply this somehow. What can we do? Okay, we'll do this. And then let's think about it as we go on. So that's like a mini learning cycle. <laughs>